excited to present to you Mina Candlewall. She is an associate professor in the departments of anthropology and gender, women's, and sexuality studies. Um, she is here today to speak to us on combustion, a feminist perspective on cook stove improvement campaigns in India. Um, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible. And I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, including the University of Iowa Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, the University of Iowa International Programs, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank today's special sponsors, including Alan Swanson with Blank and McCune Realty, Mike Margolin, oh. Mike Margolin. Um, I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and UI Libraries Digital Archives. Please be sure to like City Channel 4 on Facebook if you haven't already. So yeah, so it is my pleasure to introduce you today, Mina Kendallwall. So I want to first um, just um, acknowledge that this is part of a project. So this is, you'll be learning about one uh, chapter in a book that I'm writing, but the larger project is really a collaborative project that has involved a um, number of my colleagues here at the University of Iowa, a few of whom are in the audience, um, and um, our partner organization in India Foundation for Ecological Security. And I'm gonna pull um, some, uh, information data that was collected in two different sites in India. So southern uh, Rajasthan um, over here on the western side and then um, Odisha on the, other, on the eastern side of India. So uh, these two images um, are very um, kind of ubiquitous common images that you see um, in cook stove improvement campaigns and research around cook stoves, and whether they're described or actually shown visually, um, together these two, so these are non-synchronous activities of cooking on the one hand and collecting fuel wood on the other. Obviously you can't do those, both of those things at the same time, so requires two images. But together these images represent long-standing concerns about the nexus of women, forest, and cook stoves in India. Cookstove research has focused intensely on women, but has not um, really been informed by feminist research. A feminist approach to cooking technologies in southern Raj Rajasthan and other parts of India, um, I suggest, or is what I use to push past reductive, what I would call very reductive kind of portraits of rural women. <clears throat> Whoops. So this um, metaphor of the energy ladder and climbing the energy ladder is really very ubiquitous in uh, cook stove research. Um, I'm going to try and persuade you today that a feminist and decolonial approach also shows us um, not only um, that those kinds of re narratives are reductive, but also um, shows why this kind of linear narrative of stove improvement, climbing up the energy ladder, is wrong. <laughs> so chulas come in various shapes and sizes and designs. There's a lot of regional variation. Uh, the most common uh, type of uh, chula in South Asia, or the uh, cook stove is a kind of U-shaped mud wall um, that's maybe about a foot high, and the wall functions to support the cooking pot, to contain the embers and ashes in the stove, and also to protect the fire from the wind and also the cook from the heat. So um, there is, you know, the terminology issue is a little bit complicated. For the sake of simplicity, I'm using uh, the, the sort of English terms traditional or biofuel chula or cook stove. Um, I heard all of these different words uh, being used, um, particularly in Rajasthan, mittiwala chula, which means mud, lakadi, wood chula, desiwala chula, which simply means Indian chula or local chula, gangwala, a village chula, and puranawala, which is old chula. So all of these, so there's a lot of different terms that people might commonly use, but in the cook stove literature, because that's what I'm engaging, I'm going to stick to these 
these terms of traditional or biofuel chula, even though they're quite imperfect. Um, so let's start here. <laughs> Across India, uh, the most common fuel burned in traditional chulas is wood, um, agricultural waste, residue, agricultural residue, or cattle poop, which uh, the energy researchers call solid biomass. Um, so we can decide how we want to call it. Um, but I, what I want to describe to you, sort of just starting with this plop of cow poop, um, that they can, it can take two very different pathways in terms of energy for cooking. So first, um, um, gobar is, is what it is called in Hindi. Cattle dung or gobar is, um, is a, a very common fuel. It is often um, sort of collected, mixed with dry hay or some other kind of agricultural waste, put up in the sun to dry, often in very beautiful, kind of aesthetically pleasing arrangements. I can't take credit for this photo. I found it on the internet and just liked it so much I wanted to put it in here. Um, and then it, then it can be stored as these disks, which can be used um, as needed. Um, and it produces smoke, generally, uh, when it is burned. So that is one use, drying uh, the uh, solid biomass. Um, another pathway is where the gobar is mixed um, with uh, mixed with um, water in a, in a concrete thing called a digester, which is what this is, um, that promotes decomposition to produce methane. So this gas then travels through a small tube or pipe to produce what is described as clean, i.e. smokeless cooking, on a manufactured iron or steel stove purchased uh, from the market. So here you can see the um, this, in this image, um, from where I'm standing, these images look very poor to me. I hope they look better to you. Um, but there are a couple of cows in the background. So the owner, and it is the woman of the house who manages this particular one, and that's common, that the women of the house manage these systems. She would put it in this concrete digester, add a bucket or so of water. It produces this methane, which, as you can see, is brought into the home. So where that girl is standing is the entry to the kitchen, and that little thing hanging at the top is a little kind of rubber hose through which the methane travels into the kitchen, and voila, you have clean cooking that could be just like using uh, gas or LPG in the sense that it produces no smoke at the time of burning. So in both instances, whether it's the dried gober or the gober gas, the source of energy is biomass collected from the household compound or nearby fields. But the way it is processed after collection can lead to really different experiences for the cook preparing a family meal. So when the dung is transformed into gas and transported through a hose attached to a manufactured, um, to a, uh, attached to a manufactured metal stove, the cooks can quickly turn on and off the flame um, that burns without producing any smoke. So it's highly desirable in that respect. Um, these two different pathways of gobar also uh, give the user very different degrees of control over the cooking process, um, but a little bit more than just the cooking process. So the dried gobar is typically burned in a traditional chula uh, made of mud that cooks can and often do build themselves and repair themselves. Um, without any cost, monetary cost. So while they must collect and minimal, minimally process the fuel, whether it is drying the dung or chopping wood, the technology is, itself allows them a great deal of autonomy, I would argue. In contrast, Gober gas system includes a kind of manufactured stove made from iron and steel parts, a cement digester, and tubing to carry the gas from the digester into the home. It's a rather simple technology, but also impossible to build from materials available in the immediate environment. So not only do these parts require an initial monetary investment, which is actually quite substantial for rural, poor, cash-poor families, um, to build it in the initial um, investment, but also requires cash, manufactured materials, and specialized knowledge to repair it. 
So what I have found very helpful in sort of thinking through cook stoves is what the science and technology folks would call assemblage thinking. The traditional chula, like all technologies, is an artifact embedded in cultural meaning, social arrangements, material, and ecological processes. While technology tends to be associated with industrial machinery and military weapons, scholars of feminist science and technology studies elevate the technologies of everyday life as important, and even just the act of calling them technologies is significant. Um, they also focus our attention specifically on the artifacts themselves. So stoves involve human and non-human forces and interventions that come together in variable and sometimes unpredictable ways to create energy for cooking. In their work on household energy vulnerability, Day and Walker argue that home cooking energy is not so much a system as an assemblage of different elements that are contingent upon each other and unpredictable in how they come together. So heterogeneous actors, including people, non-human things such as cow, a cow or a brick, and abstract entities such as a forest reserve uh, defined by government policy. All of these things kind of coalesce into an assemblage or a network to make cooking possible. So things such as the insulating features of clay are not just props to human endeavors, but they assert themselves in significant ways. So let's think about cooking then as an assemblage. So cooking technologies and practices are less of a system and more of an assemblage. And I'll just show you some images of some of the different kinds of uh, cook stoves that I came across in different trips to India. Um, well, this one I pulled from the internet, but this was um, a woman making a portable cook stove from a clay pot that costs about 40 cents. Um, in, in US, if you put it in US dollars. Here's a cook stove that um, my colleague Matt and I actually saw at a furniture factory in Angol, which is a, a city, a, a pretty major city in Odisha. So, but the laborers are living on the factory site and they just put together a few bricks and they use scrap wood from the furniture factory and voila, they can do their cooking, right? Here are some images from, that are taken from a kind of farmer's market, again in Angol, where you have people, they're not at their homes, they're out there at the market all day selling their stuff, and they fashion a cook stove out of an oil can. Um, and it works just fine, as you can see, and they're burning wood there. Right, And then these, this is, I added this example because it is um, an example of a kind of more modern manufactured uh, so-called efficient stove, but it uses biomass, but the biomass has been processed and densified into pellets so that it burns uh, more efficiently. Um, so dried, um, yeah, oh, sorry, so, yes, okay, there we go. So, um, this, this is a photo from a, from a roadside taba or a little roadside restaurant um, in Odisha, which, um, so what you see here is on, on the far image, a, a kind of traditional chula, although it's a very large size because it's a restaurant with these logs being put into it. So not little pieces of wood, but entire logs that are just being kind of moved into it. They have, were producing really massive amounts of food in this tiny little place. But you also see a little LPG canister here. And notice, I thought this was just really interesting, the an LPG canister usually you would see attached to a steel manufactured stove. But here they've got this, um, the, the LPG snaking through this hose, f heating this big pot, which is not on a manufactured stove, but it's rather on a pile of bricks that looks more like a traditional chula. So different fuel, Mo so-called modern fuel, but uh, but combined with an with an older technology, and all you can't really see it in the picture, but there's also an electric mixer up there up there in the corner. Um, So given social and symbolic meanings of the chula, it is not really surprising that feelings about it are complicated in India. It is both loved for the delicious flavor that its smoke imparts to food and disliked for the way it irritates the eyes and blackens the surface of cooking utensils. The chula has deep roots in Indian family life, even for some of those most committed to replacing it. 
In 2008, I had long conversations with two men who have been involved in IC or improved cook stove campaigns. One was a government official and the other was an energy researcher. In both cases, um, I learned that the mud chula was still being used in their ancestral village homes. The government official reflected, um, and this was really like after half an hour, 45 minutes of a conversation. It wasn't something that just came up immediately or that they offered. Um, when I asked whether he had personal experience with chulas, he laughed and said of his home in the village, we have gas, but my mother is happy with the miti or the mud stove. Um, and the other one um, also said that he reflected on villagers and especially the women found the traditional cooking systems better. Um, so it's easy to think of the modernizers who are promoting improved cook stoves are socially and physically very distant from those who use traditional chulas, but it's not always, not always the case. Almost everyone with whom I have spoken, chula users and development experts alike, express the view that food tastes better cooked on the traditional chula. Everybody agrees on that. Those who cook, those who are fed, those who design or sell stoves all agree on this point. However, I do not think it is simply for the sake of flavor that cooks are willing to tolerate smoky stoves. Although this assumption is often made in the cook stove literature, after all, people take up powdered milk and all these packaged processed foods. So it's not as if people are unwilling to change their cooking practices strictly for the sake of flavor. Rather, some cooks do not think that smoke is a problem at all, including some who have access to other methods of cooking. While studies that reflect on the failure of, in, of improved stoves to be adopted regularly mention the need to understand the perspectives of women who, who do most of the home cooking, there is no singular women's perspective. This is one of my points. Some women see no reason to ditch the traditional chula. They cite flavor, comfort, habit, money, all kinds of things, and others want new technologies. I aim to capture and understand the ambivalence and diversity of women's opinions about cooking technologies. So while some seem satisfied with their mud chulas, other, others complain about the time and effort that's required to procure wood and clean blackened utensils. They express concerns about deforestation and irritation about smoke. We have to do more than simply ask them what they think about already available technologies. We must dig a little deeper to better understand the assemblages, I say, within um, which stoves are embedded. So I've identified three factors that shape women's use of chulas. Age and generation would be one. The availability of fuel wood would be the second. And then housing design would be the third. And I'm only going to talk about that right now due to constraints of time. And on housing design, I really have to thank my colleague, Jerry Anthony, who was here and had to leave, who's in urban and regional planning. And it was being in India with him that sort of made me start paying attention to housing design. And I have to say, probably 10 years ago, I never would have even noticed the houses and how they were built. So in the older style of housing in rural Rajasthan, roofs are typically constructed of clay tiles laid down in overlapping rows um, or other natural material through which smoke can escape. In Rajasthan, households tend to have two chulas or two stoves, one outside and another inside for use during the rainy season. A porous roof allows the smoke to dissipate rather quickly. However, when people build modern Pukka uh, cement homes, they know that the smoke, he, he, that the heat will be trapped inside, and they also want to keep their new walls free of black carbon stains. So since the launch of the government subsidies for LPG in the last few years, many more homes now have both gas stoves and the mud chulas. It's common practice to put the gas stove and cylinder inside the house and the mud chula outside. Um, but there are other possible arrangements. So uh, Sanup uh, Vala Panandi and I visited uh, one, um, the home of one upwardly mobile Rajput family, so that's upper caste, um, middle class family, uh, living near Gogunda that had both LPG and traditional stove. So both were placed together inside a small, uh, a mud-walled, tile-roofed room, which you see here in this image, both a close-up and a, and a, and a wider view, um, with the entire side opening to the courtyard, right? So there was no door. It wasn't enclosed. This was a striking contrast to the rest of the house, which was newly built of cement in the modern style. So while there is no uniform arrangement, it was really common in the homes I visited for the traditional mud chula to be either outside 
or in a room with a roof made of tile, of clay tiles, thatch, or other materials that allow for airflow. So often like some older part of the house, so they're re renovating and building new parts of homes, but the older part is where the stove uh, is. Um, Sanup and I also visited a home in Seymad village, uh, which is about 65 kilometers from Udaipur, so it's more rural than the pre previous photo. So this was a Dalit, so a low caste family, but also upwardly mobile. Uh, we sat and chatted with their new, in their new cement home, which they were very proud of, sipping steaming cups of chai made by their daughter-in-law on a gas stove they had procured, they told me, only a year earlier. <clears throat> she was happy, the, the mother of the family was happy to have LPG because the two burners enabled her to cook vegetables and bread simultaneously, cutting in, t in half her time spent on cooking. She mentioned that they had a mud stove in the back of the house that they still use for making a particular milk-based sweet, for heating milk, and for cooking porridge for their buffalo. Um, most of their cooking, she implied, was done on the, on the LPG. She then led us around the back of the house to a shadowy room, which you see pictured here, with mud walls, a clay tile roof, and her old mud chula built into the corner, which is pictured here, and, you, and, it, and it was very dark in the room. As we chatted, it became increasingly clear to me that they used the traditional chula quite a bit more than just for these three tasks. Her adult son mentioned that they were currently using the mud stove to make roti or bread, the basic... Um, basis of a meal, um, rather than the gas stove. Because LPG is very costly, he explained, they use the mitiwala more, the mud stove more. The mother noted that she can buy more gas when she has money, but that the mud stove works even without cash. She was pleased to have both the LPG and the mud stove to have options. The use of multiple devices, depending on what, what, what is being cooked and the availability of fuel or time, called stove stacking, is common, and it presents a challenge for measuring the transition to modern, modern cooking devices. So um, <clears throat> here's, a, here's another home that I visited with my colleague Margaret Beck in just January 2020. Um, we were invited to a village home for tea. The family had LPG in, in the paka, or new part of the home, and the chula um, in the old part of the home. We actually, it wasn't clear that it was old. It might have been particularly built as a kind of kitchen area. So it's not a very good photo, but this, this is the new part of the home where the LPG stove was and most of their cooking was being done. This is the roof of the old part, and I just, I'm showing you that picture because it's the best one I have, and it shows the thatched roof, which is the thing I want to I wanna, um, emphasize here. So, in fact, you could see the smoke kind of wafting out of, the, of that part of the house as we were sitting and drinking tea. These examples highlight the complexity of the home cooking assemblage in which a stove is embedded in particular cultural, economic, spatial, and environmental contexts. They also suggest ambivalence and diversity in women's opinions about cooking technologies. The, so the standard narrative of women's lives is drudgery, chopping headloads of wood, suffering smoke in smoke-filled kitchens, is a partial truth, I would say, reductive to the point of being untrue. Despite this, it has inspired an enduring search for technologies that will free, supposedly free Indian women from the vicious cycle of poverty, drudgery, and environmental degradation. Simplistic narratives either blame women for destroying forests and their own health, or cast them as victims of patriarchal families or of the state's disregard for their needs. Um, I think we can do better. So improved cook stoves, ICs we call them for short, improved cook stoves incorporate a whole range of technological adjustments that promise to reduce fuel use and or harmful emissions while still relying on solid biomass energy. Um, these are rather modest efforts to tinker with the stove design and fuel processing in order to achieve incrementally improved efficiency. Um, these efforts span decades and involve global networks of researchers and advocates uh, working together worldwide. India has been a primary site for this research and the development and distribution of ICs um, since the 1940s when organized efforts began. 
I've identified um, or I see three distinct stages of India's um, improved cook stove campaigns. And um, this, by the way, so this is a photo of um, maybe you can read the sign, Biomass Cook Stove Testing Center. This is at Maharana Pratap University in Udaipur. So this is a research center where they test uh, biomass cook stoves. And the reason I put this picture up there is because the door is padlocked, because once the government began promoting LPG, they stopped all this activity, and, and literally that whole place is shut down right now. So I see three generations, and I don't have time to really go into the differences very much here, so I'm just going to make a few comments about what I see as the three different generations of cook stove improvement campaigns. So the first generation, in the first generation, these stoves were really um, custom built. Um, they begin in the 1940s and go through the 1950s especially, that sort of the heyday. Um, and the primary goal of these stoves was to get the smoke out of the home. And so chimneys were one of the main, one of the main things. Um, they were, the energy science researchers view these early models as technologically quite deficient um, in terms of fuel efficiency due to their construction from a kind of sand clay uh, material, which in their mind, um, um, and based on a lot of research, causes three problems. So first, the walls of the clay stoves must be thick to provide strength, but then the large mass absorbs a lot of heat, which could otherwise go to cooking, right? So it's not very efficient. Second, the clay stoves are vulnerable to disintegrating in the rain or cracking from the heat, and so they don't have a very long lifespan. Or third, they're constructed on site, which makes their quality control more difficult. And this is the point I want to emphasize here. So two things happened in the early 1980s that really shifted the field of cook stove improvement. One was a lot of new research on health impacts and a growing consensus among public health um, researchers and advocates about they were kind of really raising the alarm about the health impacts of cooking with biofuel, particularly indoors. And then there was, um, in the early 1980s, there emerged a whole set of new testing methods for testing the efficiency of cook stoves. A persistent challenge in the development of new um, of ICs has been the competing goals of, on the one hand, establishing uniform standards of careful measurement of emissions and heat transfer, um, and on the other hand, meeting the diverse needs of cooks who are living in different climates, cooking different foods, burning different kinds of biomass, all of that. So for example, a closed firebox um, might increase the efficiency of fuel use or of combustion, um, but it also blocks the light. And some cooks may want to need that light, particularly if they don't have electricity in their home. So. Um, Custom-built stoves address this diversity, but they resist standardization. The second generation um, of ICs, which emerged in the 1980s and 90s, aimed to improve the quality and lower costs by manufacturing stoves locally and internationally. So you have, um, but many problems emerged, right, as for example, when rain comes in through chimneys into people's stoves and kitchens. Um, and in general, these stoves, I can't go into it now, face a whole array of problems. So thus, at the close of the 20th century, with the millions of ICs engineered and disseminated, there was really little evidence that they were being widely used. So then we come to the third generation. So the early 2000s saw kind of three important shifts in experts' understanding of um, the health and climate aspects of cooking with biomass. So there were increasing concerns about the problem of rural outdoor pollution um, in India. So then directing smoke out of the house through a chimney is no longer much of a solution. Another emerging consensus held that household cooking fires produce greenhouse pollutants that contributed to the melting of the glaciers and global warming. And finally, LPG, the most widely used alternative source of, of, of clean fuel for cooking is a fossil fuel that contributes to global warming as well. And as a non-renewable resource of energy, subject to the dynamics of international markets that are often shaped by trade and military wars, right? So, this, so the idea that they would, uh, it, that fossil fuel or LPG was unlikely to ever really be affordable for most people. 
Um, so in response, the government of India kind of in in particularly starting in 2009, began to promote the development of a new generation of household stoves with better technologies for processing biomass and more effective distribution um, um, strategies. So um, I won't go into the technicalities of these here, um, but the obstacles seem kind of predictable and familiar. High performance ABS stoves um, require more costly materials compared to mud, um, centralized manufacturing facilities and effective quality control and more processing of the fuel at the household level by cutting wood into small pieces or using pellets or briquettes. Such adjustments made them less affordable and less convenient for many people. So there's a variety of reasons that these stoves have not caught on and that the traditional chula persists. Um, I won't go into those here except to just make two brief points. One, that technological improvements that succeed on the efficiency metric sometimes create new problems and may lose features of the cooking technology that people actually want or need. Um, and two, a broader dynamic is that... Um, Engineers and other technically trained researchers seek standardization generally for quality control and to ensure proper function that might replicate the lab-based per performance of a stove. Um, uh, because shoddy construction and modification by users can erase all those hard-won improvements in efficiency that have been achieved in the lab. And yet it is san the standardization that makes ICs less adaptable and less appealing and less likely to be used. So just very briefly, um, I want to suggest that technology dreams are about progress, modernization, and the future. But I think that this particular model of a cook stove, um, born in the twilight of the first generation of ICs, offers lessons that are relevant for today. Um, and one is that it was a prototype that was invented by a, a non-literate, low-caste village woman um, who was irritated with the smoke in her house and was trying to adjust and tinker with her stove to get the smoke out. Um, and then um, Mathu Sarin, who, who we have brought here to campus, who was working with the Ford Foundation, kind of saw this and kind of vowed to help her. Because of her job at the Ford Foundation, she had access to a Jeep, and so she was able to take women around to other villages to start building these uh, improved cook stoves. That was the prototype invented by this woman in the village, um, and also to train other women to do that. So it kind of seemed successful. Women liked it. They were using it. They were demanding that. Um, the, and so people started to sit up and pay attention. So um, demand very quickly grew. Um, long story short, um, the government got on board. There was very rapid expansion, and the rapid expansion itself led to all sorts of problems. And by 2002, the whole program was abandoned after a really lot of investment. Um, the not the not a chilla story, I think, is revisit is worth revisiting for two reasons, and nobody really pays attention to this. It's like oh, that old thing from the past. Um, first of all, it reminds us that process matters, and I wasn't able to give you all the details that really show why it was the process was part of why it was successful. Um, there was a lot of feedback between the engineer designers and the and mostly women users. Shortcutting the process in order to scale up quickly and efficiently may be the very thing that derails an intervention. And secondly, and probably more importantly, the Nada Chula example dislodges the assumption that technological innovation is something that male engineers and scientists do, mostly in labs, but sometimes in the field. We ought to begin with the assumption that non-literate people have long been tinkering with the basic chula design, and that they are also innovators of technology. So a couple of examples that I think kind of, um, I, would, I just want to sort of rethink what is technological innovation. So this is a woman I met who actually lives in the city of Udaipur. Well, she lives sort of on the edges of the city, but she works in the city. Um, for an NGO. And when um, I was talking to her about cook stoves and, and she was uh, kind of describing the kind of stove she uh, used. And then she said, oh, come on outside. And we go around to the back of the office where we were sitting. And she finds this old 
this is called a matka, this old uh, clay pot, which is, had been discarded and thrown in the corner. She picks it up. She starts to chip away at this hole that you see on the side and shows me how she can make a chula out of this piece of trash, basically, right? And that thing on the top would be where you would, where you would uh, cook the bread. Um, so I'm calling that technological innovation. <laughs> um, and who are people who innovate in uh, technology, who innovate technologies. So this was um, also a really kind of interesting um, story, and my colleagues haven't heard about this yet because they weren't there on this trip. Um, so this was a village where Sanup and I stopped, um, and we were, and as often you, happens in villages, there are a bunch of men sitting around chatting, socializing, and women aren't really around because they're all really busy working. Um, but so we started uh, just chatting with the men, and this man who's seated over here, we told him we were interested in cook stoves and asking what kinds of cook, cook stoves are people using in this village. And so he takes us into this house, which is not his house, but his neighbor's house, and we go up to the top floor, and we find this little room. So this is the outside of the room, and that's the inside of the room, and the... And the um, woman and, and her daughter who were there, they tell us that this was a cook stove that was built by uh, an NGO, pe some people who came from outside. They didn't even know who those people were or where they had come from or what institution they were from. Um, they had torn up their old cook stove and they built this new and improved cook stove, um, which they weren't using, partly because it was too big to fit their utensils and partly because it was made out of a cement thing that was a, a mixture that was supposed to make it more efficient and more durable, but when it cracked, they couldn't repair it themselves. So it was basically not being used. There was also a chimney there. But they also had um, this kind of cement. This is a cement molded kind of like a traditional chula, but it's also manufactured out of a mold, out of cement, so it's different, um, that they were using. And then you see an LPG canister in the back. So they're using all of those. And then as we're talking, this man says, oh, come to my house. You have to meet my mother, and you have to see her cook stove. So we, so we walk the three minutes or five minutes um, down the pathway to his house, and there he calls his mother out, um, this elderly lady in the, in the pink there. And she um, brings out a chula that she has just finished building, but they weren't using it yet because I think it was curing. And she talked about how she made it and the very, the sort of angle of the inside wall and how that helped things burn better. And there was a lot of knowledge um, in how she built this cook stove. And her son clearly recognized that knowledge and said that she was, like everyone in the village recognized that she was uh, really good at making these stoves, right? And her three daughters-in-laws were there and, and I asked if they could make them and they're like, no, we like, no, everyone agreed that they didn't have that expertise and knowledge uh, that she had. So um, even non-literate women who are usually the target of cook stove campaigns are innovating, improving their cook stoves and have been for generations and generations. So the question of LP, of whether LPG is a solution um, is a, is a, long discussion that we don't have time for here. We can come back to it in the um, Q&A if you like. Um, but I just suffice it to say that there's no consensus about that at this point, even though uh, LPG distribution is going on at a rapid pace and many more people are using it. So back to the energy ladder. <clears throat> So the notion that people climb the energy ladder towards better lives seems self-evidently true by the simple fact that LPG is a, a marker of middle-class status and urban life. But technological innovation is not driven uh, by linear, rational, value-neutral, and inevitable scientific progress. And this is what the feminist science and technology um, people have shown very well. The latter metaphor expresses a kind of common sense modernity logic of linear progression from simple biomass stoves to complex modern manufactured technologies. By this logic, traditional chulas will be made obsolete by the adoption of LPG stoves, microwave ovens, and so on. Clearly that's not going to happen, or it's certainly not going to happen anytime soon. LPG depends on political and economic centralization as it requires processing of raw material, global commodity chains, 
government regulation, and private infrastructure for distribution to rural kitchens. So this modern, modernity logic is wrong, I, I'm um, arguing, for several reasons, um, including um, the pervasiveness of stove stacking, which really doesn't align very well with that sort of ladder metaphor of moving from this kind of fuel to that kind of fuel. It's a little more mixed up than that. Nor does the fact of biomass being turned, being burned in urban areas, align, urban areas and even by middle class people align very well with that energy ladder. The line between low tech and high tech is fuzzier than we'd like to think. And technological interventions can involve the cooking device, the fuel, or sometimes both. It could be just one or the other, or it could be both. My inquiry is not driven by the assumption of an inevitable linear progression from traditional chulas to modern LPG or electricity. If we accept the energy ladder metaphor, then gober gas, right, made from the cow plop, um, would be at the bottom rung, though it actually produces clean burning cooking flames, at least clean at the point of the kitchen. So the imagined energy ladder is not very helpful for understanding our own cooking technologies and pre preferences either. Um, so on the opposite side of the planet from these uh, rural villages of cash poor people, um, you have the top chefs of New York and Los Angeles embracing a revival of cooking with wood, um, saying it is not only, uh, well, I quote from New York Times, it is not only American restaurateurs, but also home cooks who are rejecting gas and charcoal to, quote, master the ancient art of grilling over a wood fire in their backyards. <laughs> and so on. So that energy ladder doesn't help us make sense of this either. These two wood fire scenarios, so the rural village woman cooking on her chula and the top chef in New York, they seem really disconnected. One, you know, one associated with the simplest meals prepared in poor rural homes and the other with oat cuisine. But actually Udaipur, which is a tourist um, city, now has the latest craze of wood fire pizzas. Um, <laughs> So it's not just here. Um, so the modernization logic uh, makes our singular focus on the lifestyles of the poorest people in the world seem like common sense. But we need a perspective that is broader, more complex, and attentive to the process of how knowledge is produced about faraway places. The drive towards technology fixes rests on a whole set of beliefs about human behavior that have no basis in evidence. So let me end by just suggesting that we ditch the latter metaphor <laughs> and start somewhere else. Um, thank you for your attention today. Okay, to start off, um, we have a question that asks, have you seen any trials of the use of solar power at the village level or wider? Okay, thank you for the question. I would bump that question to Ode, but it looks like he's left. Um, so this whole, this whole project for all of us started with a solar cooker that he was trying to design with his students in the College of Engineering. Professor Ode Kumar, yes, who was one of my collaborators mentioned at the beginning. Um, so I guess what I have learned um, from them is that the challenges of using solar at the household level are very high um, that have to do with the the high heat that you need for cooking bread and the storage of the energy. That said, there is um, there are places uh, we know, and I, I I can't speak with great authority on this, where solar is being used for cooking, but it tends to be used and most effective for communal cooking rather than individual households. So that's also a factor, right? How how do people organize themselves for cooking? So the next question is, um, Indian cooking shows on TV are invariably shot, invariably shot in modern kitchens. As TV continues to spread even into rural areas, do the media play a role in cook stove preference or adoption? And would it be worth studying the influence of the media, not just through LPG campaigns, but more broadly? Um, yes, absolutely. It would be a great project for somebody to do who um, is knowledgeable about media and things like that. I mean, one thing that seems clear is that for 
people all over India, I think we all agree on this, that LPG is aspirational. LPG is because and it has to do with this. It is what they see in movies or on TV, middle class people. That is what the affluent people in the world cook with is LPG. Um, so they like having it doesn't mean they're going to use it all the time for some of the reasons I discussed, but they're happy to have it. So yeah, I think media is really an important factor there. Okay, so for the next question, um, what happens when the bottom rung, and not to mention the others, of the desirable um, type of resource for burning um, of the energy ladder has been harvested and burned? Meaning when there's no biomass left? Is that, am I understanding the question correctly? Um, well, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, Matt, Hill and Margaret Beck and I are, are looking at right now is actually not so much focused on the cook stoves, but on fuel wood and the economies of fuel wood. So clearly that's a big factor. And it does seem to be the case that uh, one of the things I wasn't able to talk about is that, um, okay, the assumption is that pe as people have um, upward mobility, they will uh, stop using fuel wood right? And they'll move to LPG. I found that to be um, not necessarily true because what I found is that some of the families who were upwardly mobile and you would expect them to not be using wood anymore were using wood. And the reason they were still using wood was because they owned land. And so it was easy for them to get a supply of wood for, for without having to pay for it and without having to go far to get it for, for um, cooking. But poorer families who don't have land who would have to might have to buy wood are that is a sort of definitely a push towards uh, using modern energy to the degree that it is made affordable. We also found though a lot of uh, people in cities using scrap wood like from manufacturing uh, as cooking fuel. What are some ways, if any, in which you have seen changes in gender equality and women's opportunities in correlation with the spread of improved cookstove technology? Okay, that is the million dollar question for me. Um, I don't feel like I have a definitive answer to that. I do feel like it's a lot more complicated than we think it is, this assumption that women will move to modern cooking technologies, and the whole narrative is that it will free them, it will make their lives easier, it will free their labor. We know even from looking at the history of cooking technologies and domestic technologies in the U.S. that that wasn't really the case, that people, as new domestic technologies came up, what happened? You all know, right? The expectations for domestic work increase dramatically. So you go from one pot cooking in, I guess, the early 1800s, 1700s, you cooked a stew in a fireplace, right? And then by the time you get the closed uh, cook stove, and I'm talking about in the U.S. here, the history of cooking technologies in the U.S., now people are building making, women are making these much more complex meals of yeasted breads, of several dishes, then you have all the pots to clean, so the, the scholars, the feminist scholars of science and technology we are pretty clear that it doesn't necessarily make women's work less. It changes women's work. And, it may, and that new work may be more prestigious, but it doesn't mean it's less hours. In fact, it might mean more work that goes along with increased status, right? Does that make sense? Okay, and I believe this is the final question. Um, using the methane gas approach and bringing it via hose into the kitchen, um, what percent of the methane escapes into the atmosphere um, given its potency as a greenhouse gas, and what is the level of concern about that? Okay, it's a good question. Um, it's a technical question I don't have an answer to. Do you have an answer to that? Do you know? Not, not in specific. Yeah. Um, so I don't know 
there doesn't seem to be a lot of concern about that. I will have to say that everybody, including us and our students and the people we've worked with in India, everybody who sees these biogas systems gets very excited about them because it seems like such a great solution. It is off grid in a way. You know, it is the there's no the waste. So the waste, the slurry that is produced is a very highly valued fertilizer. So farmers can save money on buying fertilizer. They can go to organic farming. They can even sell that fertilizer. It's so valuable. So I'm, I'm sure there are downsides. But most most of us who have seen those systems working have been really impressed but they also haven't spread across India, right? It's just many of the same obstacles that um, prevent improved cookstoves from spreading. Okay, great. So um, with that, we will conclude our program. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Mina for a wonderful presentation. And then I'd like to take a moment to also thank our sponsors once again, um, the University of Iowa Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, um, as, long, er, as well as today's special sponsors, Alan Swanson, Blake, Blank and McCune Realty, Mike Margolin, and again, we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Um, Mina, as a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug. <laughs> Thank you all and we're adjourned. Thank you.